Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to note that live captioning and sign language translation are available and that the recording of today's uh, session will be posted later today. Today we'll be able to go until 2 p.m. and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Uh, uh, you Please ask your questions using the Q&A function. We'll continue these briefings every other week, at least through the month of May. Uh, today, we're joined by Provost Susan Collins, Vice President for Student Life, Martino Harmon, Chief, Chief Health Officer, Dr. Preeti Malani, and Dana Habers, the Chief Department Administrator in Radiology and Co-Lead of Michigan Medicine's COVID-19 Vaccination and Therapeutics Task Force. I know many of you have asked about commencement, and I want to share the update we provided yesterday afternoon. We will open Michigan Stadium to graduating students during our virtual May 1st Ann Arbor commencement ceremony. Attendance will be ticketed and limited to graduates. We're adding this opt-in event for graduates who wanna celebrate their accomplishments together with their classmates. And it follows two important changes. The state of Michigan has increased the allowed capacity of outdoor stadiums, and we're seeing far fewer COVID-19 cases among our students. To help us do this safely, we'll have a number of protocols and precautions in place. Uh, this is all described on our commencement website. Whether graduates choose to view the ceremony remotely with family or friends, or alongside their classmates in the big house, graduation is such a special time for all of us at U of M, and we wanna make this milestone in our graduates' lives as memorable as possible. And now to turn things over to Dr. Milani. Yeah, thank you, Mark. You know, before we launch into COVID, I just, I wanted to take a minute to acknowledge the pain a lot of people in the community are feeling at this moment. And I know I've been in touch with many people in the past few weeks, especially in, you know, hatred and hostility, unfortunately, are not new, but clearly in the recent weeks and months, there's been an escalation in some of these sentiments. And I just, I think somehow this is so much more painful on the heels of months and months of isolation. And, you know, when I think back to my own coming to this campus, as a, as a youngster, as an 18 year old, I remember really always feeling like I belonged here. And I also remember meeting so many people who were really different than me, had different stories and how much I've gained from those friendships. And you know, for the students in the final weeks of this crazy bizarre year, I really encourage everyone to maybe reach out to friends you've lost touch with, check in with people, meet new people if you get a chance, either virtually or in, in person in safe ways. And, you know, I know the academic units are trying to create some opportunities. I know student life is as well. And there was recently a, a wellness day uh, in the College of Engineering that was really well attended. And uh, to everyone who really feels distressed, especially the students, I just, I want you to know that you are always welcome here, that you are loved and that you make our community better. And to everyone else who's really trying to figure out how to be helpful, including parents, um, I just wanna share something that one of my friends always says, which is that, Support is a verb. It means taking a stand and taking action. Uh, so let's, let's start by talking to one another. Um, on to COVID, uh, after having some of the lowest infection rates around, Michigan looks like it is catching up to some of the surrounding rates, so surrounding states. And um, like with all things COVID, it's never just one thing, it's multiple things. The state has loosened restrictions, as people know, on dining and gathering and most importantly, and you know, I, I spoke with Emily Martin yesterday because I keep getting texts from people saying, what's going on in Michigan? Um, the mobility data in our state shows that we're moving around like we used to pre-pandemic. And uh, around the state, people are gathering in large groups, often without masks indoors. And there've been multiple outbreaks in the state of 50 to 60 people go to a social event, everyone gets infected. So even as vaccination numbers are really increasing, the risk isn't gone. And Infections are being seen in younger people, including kids 10 to 19, and then uh, also young adults. And uh, there's been an uptick in hospitalizations, and sadly, we're going to probably see the deaths uh, increase too. Campus, on the other hand, is better. Uh, we're, we're lower as a portion of county cases. We are still seeing 50 to 60 new cases a week. Test positivity for the surveillance program is about 0.6%. I will say the daily update today showed that 12 students did move into quarantine and isolation housing. So I think that that is um, it's a good reminder that um, the risk is not gone. And I think all of us hang on for a few more months, keep wearing those masks in public, 
maintain distance, avoid crowds. Instead, gather in small numbers, gather outside. You know, frankly, if you have a mask on and you're outside, you're safe. And most importantly, when it's your turn, please get vaccinated. And we'll talk more about that. Thanks, Dr. Milani. Uh, I now turn things over to Provost Collins for an update on campus summer programs. Great, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you. It's a Nice to be here again and to provide an update. Um, I'd like to start once again, though, by really thanking our students, our staff, and our faculty. As we head into the final months of this crazy semester and this uh, quite stressful academic year, I know how challenging things have been and continue to be, even though, as Preeti uh, has just reminded us, um, there are many very positive signs uh, which are, are great to see. I'm inspired every day by the perseverance, the creativity, and just all of the hard work that have brought us to uh, the point where we are today. Um, and so as, as noted, what I'd like to do is to give an update looking forward to the spring and the summer campus programs. Prior to the pandemic, as, as you know, we had many exciting activities on our campus during the summer months, a whole array of, of different types of things. But as you know, last year, our offerings for spring and summer were fully virtual. So this year, we're pleased to be able to offer a somewhat more in-person spring and summer with a variety of opportunities, but we are proceeding judiciously. We want to make sure that we're following the public health guidance, but also that we're not placing an unreasonable strain on our infrastructure systems as we look ahead and plan for what will be a much more in-person fall term. So again, many of the offerings will continue to be remote for the spring and summer. So the top priorities for in-person activities were those that our schools and colleges requested to do in person that involve University of Michigan students, including, of course, our entering freshmen. The focus will be on those activities that are most important to be conducted in person, having those done in person with other classes offered online. And that means that overall for University of Michigan students, we're going to be offering a similar kind of distribution of modalities to what we are offering in the current semester. Our research enterprise has been ramping up gradually, as you know, and as of April 1st, in-person research activities across campus will be open and active, and this will apply for spring and summer terms as well. Following University of Michigan COVID protocols and with the approval of the PI, students and research trainees will be able to join research teams. Lab research is operational. It no longer requires density limits beyond social distancing and face coverings. Furthermore, all tiers of human research will be eligible to apply for in-person activities beginning April 1st. Also, field researchers with a safety plan that's been approved may conduct spring and summer field work. Finally, we're pleased to announce some additional types of programs that may be approved for in-person offerings. First, the university has typically offered a wide array of summer programs that support our diversity, equity, and inclusion goals by helping to prepare students from underrepresented groups for success in our undergraduate and graduate programs. And some of these will be offered with in-person components this summer. Second, we typically offer a number of highly valued off-campus classes and research programs for our University of Michigan students, such as our offerings at the BioStation. We're working with appropriate units to ensure that appropriate health and safety protocols and infrastructure would be in place for these special opportunities for our students as well. Other types of activities will remain virtual if they are offered. And this includes, for example, overnight programs for minors and professional development opportunities for adults. So we will be making some additional announcements in the coming weeks about whether any other spring and summer programs will be offered this year, and if so, in which modalities. So again, I'm pleased to have an opportunity to provide this update uh, in today's briefing. Thank you.
Uh, Preeti, it's uh, uh, up to you now. Yeah, thanks. So uh, just to follow up on uh, Provost Collins' comments around spring, summer, I just wanna talk a little bit about testing and uh, where the program is gonna be with that. So weekly testing through the community sampling and tracking program is gonna continue and it'll be required from some students during the spring and summer terms. And again, this applies to students living on campus, which is not a lot of students uh, traditionally who are gonna be in the residence halls. There will be some graduate students who are here sort of year round and a small number of undergraduates. And those registered for in-person and hybrid classes, as well as those access, accessing U of M buildings and facilities, either because they work there or they're doing research, uh, under the policy, students who are vaccinated, fully vaccinated, will have the option to request an exemption from the mandatory testing requirement. And you know, I'll just say more details on how to request this exemption is going to, uh, based on vaccination status, is going to be released soon on uh, the campus Maize and Blue, Blue website. And basically, there will be a place to submit this vaccination information, and it'll be reviewed. And uh, if the student qualifies for an exemption, they'll, they'll uh, be exempted from that mandatory testing. And uh, right now, uh, the teams, including the IT teams, Jim Beam and others, are really working on the tracking mechanism. And I know there are gonna be some questions about, well, why aren't we making a change now? You know, we still don't have big numbers of students vaccinated. It is increasing, thankfully, and we're gonna talk about that in a bit. Uh, but this is, this is um, something that's in the works uh, and it'll sort of set us up for, for the spring where there are just fewer people to, to deal with. And I did also wanna mention that um, some people who have been exempted right now, there are gonna be some changes to your response of Blue app, you know, kind of thinking ahead to some of the events on campus, including commencement, where you, you uh, will likely need to be showing that response of Blue app. So more to come on that. And uh, you know, stay tuned is what I would say. And uh, I'd like to move on to uh, student life, if we may. I know we have some questions and we have uh, Martino here. So Martino, <laughs> so weather's getting better. Uh, are you gonna bring back the canopies that were so popular in the fall now that the weather's warmer? Hi Preeti, uh, hello everyone. You know, it, it doesn't feel like it today, but the weather, the weather really is going to get better and it was better a few days ago. So, yes, I am super excited uh, that the canopies will return on April 6th. And this is really a collaborative effort with campus partners from academic affairs and uh, facilities and operations. But they'll be back up. So meet a friend there, grab a meal, grab an ice cream cone, um, study there if you choose to do so, or just sit and have a safe, socially distant uh, conversation with people under the canopies. And if students uh, want more information about where they're located in the guidelines, just Google UMich canopy information and it's all there. But I would also mention if, you know, students don't uh, feel comfortable studying under the canopies, maybe it might be too distracting. Um, you can continue to reserve study spaces in various places across campus, such as Trotter, the unions and, and other locations. And you can look under studyspaces.umich.edu to find those locations. And finally, I'll mention some really good news. Based on feedback from students, the uh, unions will extend their hours, uh, the Michigan Union rather, will extend the hours and starting April 1 will be open until midnight. And this will really help with more study spaces as we get closer to uh, exams. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. I actually was in the union yesterday at the tech shop because I had a laptop uh, mishap, which of course is like a, it's like a major disaster <laughs> during like a, a remote uh, living right now. But I was so impressed with the way the union has been set up. And I was really pleased to see so many students there uh, working uh, quietly. Uh, and so it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful space. Um, how are you helping students have more opportunities for in-person interactions? So we've got a real advantage with the weather warming up that, as you mentioned earlier, you know, outside with masks on, socially distant, you know, it's, it's an opportunity for people to get out and get, you know, just get some air and take advantage of that. We also have to remember that we still have state and county gathering limits, which are really important for us to abide by those to, to keep the, the risk down low. Uh, but I want to give some examples, some fun examples. Uh, last Tuesday, 
um, the Center for Campus Involvement had fun at the union and students could bring their friends to sign up for rounds of cornhole, giant Jenga, um, giant Connect Four, all on the law of the Michigan Union. And I, I want to say I, I'm, I'm upset that I missed that, but uh, cornhole is, is my game. So I will happily take <laughs> some students on in cornhole. And uh, so they better bring it. Uh, but some other examples. I, I don't know. I might I might take you up on that. I, well, let's, um, I, let's I'm do a that. cornhole let's fan do that. too. <laughs> let's do that. Some other examples, though, that are important to mention. Um, uh, last Tuesday, there was an event called Smash Your Stress. Yes, I, I did say Smash Your Stress. And this is actually a, a wellness um, activity. So basically, students could, could write um, on, on things, write about things that stress them out and on a plate and actually safely smash them in the diag. So, I mean, it's a good way to relieve some stress and focus on the things that, that cause you stress. And then I'll mention uh, something really exciting. Uh, this is such a, a special time that both our men's and women's basketball teams are in the NCAA tournament, as well as our hockey team. But we are having a, a game watch in the big house and very safe. Have to show your response to blue, be masked up. Uh, you, students will be seated socially distanced. And there'll be a maximum of 1,000 students per game this weekend. And the focus this weekend is on a lottery for first year students because they've never had that experience before. But if we do have open spots, we may open up the lottery to other students as well. And as the teams continue to, to win, which they will, uh, we'll have more lotteries and it'll be focused on a broader group of students. So I'm really excited about that. And then events like you mix uh, late night on the Diag and sand volleyball and spike ball intramural, intramural tournaments. So the weather just opens up so many opportunities for more things. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people out and about on Palmer Field too. And you know, I'll just add, uh, I was a student here in 89 when we when we won it all. And, and I'm waiting, I'm, I keep waiting for the <laughs> next uh, the next time. But you know, what a what a special memory for, for the students. And again, like men's and women's basketball, congratulations to both teams. I know it's been a, a, a very difficult year for them in many ways, and they've just been, they make us so proud. Uh, are there any new details available about what you're going to be doing to make uh, the fall 2021 really extra special for our, our second year students, our sophomores? So, you know, the, the vaccines, of course, provide us with many um, optimistic opportunities. And we're in the, the planning stages with our academic partners, um, because many of the early programming during Welcome Week is in partnership. So what we're really looking at is strengthening that experience and what we would call a second year experience. And it's opportunities for second year students to take advantage of some of those traditional rites of passage um, programs that they missed out on, such as uh, walking through the fountain or creating the block M picture. So those are things that we're working on, as well as um, during that, that Welcome Week, making sure that there are opportunities for second year students to participate, which is not normally what we do, but this is a very different year. And then finally, I'll mention our resource navigator program, which we launched this year, which allows uh, student life staff over 120 to reach out to over 2000 first and second year students who don't seem to be connected with another group. That's something that we've learned that works from the pandemic and we'll carry that over into next uh, next year and it'll have a focus on first and second year students again and, and, and have more volunteers um, to reach more students. So many more things to talk about over the coming weeks. Details are still in development, but, uh, but I'm really excited about the future. Yeah, I'm, I'm so pleased to hear that. And I, you know, I say that as uh, someone who graduated from here, but also as a, as a current parent. And you know, I would just say to the students too, you know, it, it takes a little effort but I, I think you're going to be very rewarded. I, you know, sometimes it feels like, well, I don't really want to go. Go, <laughs> just go, right. and uh, you'll have a good time. Give it, give it a try. So thank you, Martino, and uh, we're going to tee up um, Dana Habers uh, to talk about vaccination. And you know, just as a little background, I, I just want to make a couple comments as as we are getting to a next phase. You know, vaccination. The data are looking better and better. You know, obviously the safety is great, but the effectiveness is just looking better and better. Uh, even to the point where infectiousness and if you do get COVID, uh, the viral the the viral burden is really low. And uh, again, the news just gets better and better. And just a reminder: the beginning 
Um, on Monday, April 5th, everyone over 16 will be eligible in, in Michigan. And uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit with Dana. And you know, there are a lot of different sources. And I know it's been a, quite frustrating for people, but things are opening up and people are going to, to different locations. And I've heard of a lot of students signing up to go to Ford Field and you know, that's, that's a good option too. Uh, just a quick note to students is sort of just think about the timeline of vaccination um, and dosing. And if you're getting something that requires two doses, just think about like when you might be leaving town, when you might have exams, commencement, things like that. But uh, with that, I um, will uh, we'll talk with uh, Dana here a bit. Uh, Dana. Hello. Uh, how are you? <laughs> I know you've been <laughs> super busy. So thank you for everything that you guys have been doing. I mean, it's um, it's heavy, heavy work. So thank you. Uh, question that a lot of people asked is, will Michigan Medicine start providing uh, vaccinations to main campus, not Michigan Medicine, which was obviously done in the 1A, uh, faculty and staff? Yeah, thank you. And thanks for having me back. It's always fun to be here. I, uh, my, my answer to that is it's vaccine supply dependent, which I know is very annoying. And uh, especially with something like this to not have great certainty. Um, I think back to our original guiding principles when we stood up the task force and started thinking through how we would get vaccines out into our community. We said all along we would administer vaccines to as many people as we can as quickly and safely as possible, and that we would vaccinate everybody who wanted to be vaccinated. And we've stuck true to that. Um, however, it has been at a much slower pace than we had really hoped and, and that we actually built out infrastructure to deliver. So um, what we are seeing is with a shift in vaccine supply, and this is both at the federal and state level for a variety of reasons far upstream from us, um, we know that vaccine supply is being distributed to a lot of different entities. So I think for us directly, the difficult news is we don't know if we'll have enough to be able to get to everybody in time, particularly those who um, are heading home for the summer, leaving the area for the summer. But the good news is we know that there are a lot of options and, and new options hitting the scene every day. So um, our role, I think, has shifted not only from the vaccine clinical delivery system that we've built, which will continue to run. And every week we're delivering every dose that we receive to the, the populations we're serving, but also as a, a, a shepherd of sorts and, and information source to try to help everybody who hasn't been able to come to Michigan Medicine for their vaccine or come to the stadium site for their, their vaccine yet, um, to help them understand what options are out there. Um, so we're encouraging you to if you're in blue queue and you've completed that, you're on our list and we'll get to you as soon as possible, but don't wait for us. I think the messaging right now is just to make sure that you're in other queues as well. Um, for example, this week, we know that Kroger started to vaccinate. And uh, previously, we know Walgreens, CVS, obviously the Ford Field site, I'm hearing really positive feedback about FEMA's work there. And so that one's pretty easy to register. You just text uh, the word and COVID, all one word to 75049. You can get in their queue um, and a lot of other retail pharmacies. So there are options. I think this jives with the state's goal to try to get vaccine within 20 minutes of every Michigander. So instead of these just central mass sites, they're partnering with other entities to get it out and make it accessible and, and readily available across the community. So hopefully that helps with overall uptake and our goal, getting towards a goal of 70% uh, of all adults vaccinated. It's a very long answer, but um, we're only, we're about 30% right now as a state and, and we're getting there, we're making progress. So it's starting to work, but um, we do acknowledge we, we may not be the fastest option for everybody. Yeah. And uh, you know, Dana, just to your point in the state, and I, I sort of uh, obsess, obsessively look at the, the data every day. It's kind of part of my, my morning routine. And uh, we are doing really well with the oldest uh, cohorts of age. And I think the uptake has been quite good. Uh, yes. So I, it's, it's amazing because this kind of mass vaccination has never been done on this kind of scale and this kind of time, and certainly not during a pandemic. So uh, a lot of the work you've done and others like you have done to have really made this happen. So I know that uh, the administration, the Biden administration said 200 million in 100 days. Yeah. And so I think we're going to see a lot of vaccine. And again, you know, with the students, maybe they're going to get the J&J &J single dose, some of them. Yeah. So. Uh, speaking of which, uh, do you plan to vaccinate students? And if so, roughly when? 
Yeah. So you mentioned earlier, the state is actually in Michigan opening up prioritization April 5th. So all adults 16 and up will be eligible. Eligibility doesn't necessarily translate to vaccine supply. So again, we still have that uh, constraint. I think, Martino, if I can come get a plate and write vaccine supply on it, I would join your <laughs> smash your stress <laughs> um, exercise and, and try to shed some of that. But um, I, I think because of eligibility, you know, the ability to for, for students to have access through all of these different avenues is really promising. And then we are hearing from the state leadership that we expect vaccine supply to increase overall to the state. So whether that comes directly to Michigan Medicine to deliver or to our broader community through all of these different channels, I think that's really encouraging. Um, if you look at the current prioritization guidelines, you can go to MDHHS's website and see that um, April 5th date announced. Their timeline roughly for that population to have full access is in the uh, end of April, May, June uh, timeframe. And we within Michigan Medicine are in our 1C population. We just breached through 1B into 1C last week, delivering roughly two, two to 3,000 doses a week. So um, there's been progress and we're getting really close to that phase two, which is opening it up to everybody. So we're optimistic we'll see a change, pretty big change in the, the next month. Yeah, you know, I know it, it's frustrating for folks, but, it, you know, I, I think we said a month ago, it might have been a month ago, maybe it was six weeks ago, Dana, that we had you. We said, just hang on, just hang on, like, let's be patient because the supply is going to, in fact, it'll probably outstrip demand eventually. So, um, and, and we, we talked about this is that uh, April 5th, Michigan will be open to all adults. So it's really actually 16 and over. And uh, how many do you expect to do per week at Michigan Medicine? Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, we have kept our infrastructure ready. So even though we haven't been able to use it, we have the sites, we still are running the stadium, we're running our Brighton Health Center facility. We've done several community outreach kind of pop up um, versions at a smaller scale. And then we have the uh, North Campus Research Center location that we could open up if we needed to, if we had the vaccine supply to do that. So from a capacity standpoint, if the supply is there, we could still deliver upwards of 20,000 doses a week. Um, what we, we've been at the roughly seven to 900 a day or roughly two to 3,000 a week thus far, just simply based on the uh, limitation of supply. Yeah, one of the reminders I like to make too is that vaccination doesn't just help us. It obviously does protect us, but it protects everyone around us. So even if it's not you, the fact that other people around us are getting vaccinated is, is a good thing. And uh, it, it's gonna happen. It's just a matter of whether, whether we're gonna catch our students before some of them head back. And you know, your home locations, at least in the United States, should, should be well stocked for, for vaccination. Um, is Michigan Medicine using all the doses it receives? You sort of mentioned this. Yeah, we, we are. We, uh, we have a pretty, strong at this point, regional collaboration as well. So we get allocations directly from the state. And then we also meet every Friday, actually, right after I leave here, we'll get together with our colleagues at, at IHA and St. Joe's and Washtenaw County Health Department uh, and come together and say, what do you have and what can't you use? And so we might even get a secondary allocation from that collaboration. But um, we have continued to deliver everything that we receive each week. We've also been able to manage inventory to keep the second dose commitment. So thank you for making the point earlier that wherever you go for your first dose, you should also plan in your schedule to go for the second dose at the same site. Uh, the vaccine distributors are still delivering them in those series. So it's really challenging. I think we find a few people in our area too that got a first, first dose somewhere else and have come here seeking a second dose and it's a, a real challenge. So um, really important, but we are continuing to deliver everything we receive. Um, we have a really awesome on-site nursing uh, team. Uh, Sarah Didazak leads that group and they have a management process throughout the course of the day. So we know how many people we're expecting to vaccinate and how many doses to take from the freezer and reconstitute and get ready to deliver. And then uh, we make sure that at the end of the day, if there are any doses that have been reconstituted in order not to waste, we're delivering those to people who are eligible. Um, so really robust processes in place to make sure we do not waste a single dose. 
area. Yeah, I, I, I know that the waste protocol has been great. And, you know, I just want to make one last comment, really, uh, particularly to the students. I, I know some of them are afraid of needles. Um, I, I, I was one of those, those students. And, um, you know, I would just say that, first of all, the, the uh, crew that's administering these vaccines are, are just fabulous. It is, um, and I, I'm not just saying this, this is really not a painful vaccine. Your arm is a little sore the next day um, and you might be a little tired, but it's well tolerated. But you know, for students who are afraid of, of needles, if, if that is part of this, um, we're gonna um, gather some information to try to help you with that. And, and there are some techniques that can help you deal with that. I, I don't want people to miss out on something that's so important because of, 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 of this fear of needles. And, Again, we don't really have any idea what that number is, but but thank you, uh, Dana. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna turn it back over to President Schlissel to help launch us into Q&A. Yeah, Dana, before you leave, I just wanna ask you one question to follow up. Um, uh, people who are signed up with Michigan Medicine but have been lucky enough to already get on a list and get vaccinated at one of the local places. And I'll add to that list, Rite Aid is also giving out vaccinations now, and they open up appointment slots in the middle of the night. I know from my spouse's experience. Um, do people have to do anything active, or do we call our own lists, or what should folks do to be responsible if they've been vaccinated elsewhere? Yeah, thank you for asking that. I, I, uh, it does help if you have been vaccinated elsewhere to go back in and indicate that in your Blue Q questionnaire. So that's a live, living, breathing thing that you can go back and update anytime, even if your circumstances change. You may have decided earlier not to get vaccinated and now you'd like to. Uh, you can go back in and just let us know. There's a radio button you can check to let us know that you've been vaccinated already. And then we'll focus our invitations and resources on others. Um, I should also mention, thank you for bringing up Rite Aid, your campus HR website has a really fantastic ref reference that can help you find where to go for vaccine appointments. So it's under the benefits and wellness tab. And that's a really excellent resource if you're um, unsure where to sign up. Good, thanks very much, Dana. And you know, I'd like to put in my own plug for the importance of vaccination. Um, before uh, I began my career in academic leadership, I ran an, a, a basic immunology research lab. You know, we studied the parts of the immune system that respond to vaccines. And I took this slide out from one of my old teaching lectures. Uh, the most um, uh, life-saving interventions uh, that have been discovered in the history of medicine all time, in my opinion, are vaccines uh, and antibiotics and sanitation, you know, preventing infectious disease uh, from killing people. So these two charts show when a vaccine was first introduced for two different diseases, diphtheria, it's a bacterial infection, a fever, sore throat, eventually difficulty breathing, and it had a five to 10% mortality back in the early 1900s. And the infamous disease polio, a viral disorder infects motor neurons, nerve cells, uh, leading to paralysis. You know, both of these diseases have been conquered by vaccination. Uh, the uh, rate of diphtheria in the population used to be pretty similar to what we're seeing for COVID now, uh, and it's gone, essentially. You know, there may be a few thousand cases per year. And then similarly with polio, essentially eradicated in the United States and very small numbers of cases uh, elsewhere around the world. This works. Um, the current COVID vaccines, whether it's the uh, Moderna or Pfizer or J&J &J vaccines, um, they've now been given to many millions and tens of millions of people. They're about as safe as a medical intervention gets, and their effectiveness is shockingly high. Uh, even those people that will get um, uh, COVID after being vaccinated, they don't get really sick, they don't end up in the hospital, and they don't die. Uh, so I can't uh, recommend strongly enough uh, the safety and the effectiveness of any of these vaccines. Uh, personally, you know, I'm really quite sorry that we haven't been able to get from the state uh, great enough levels of supply to allow us to be the provider of vaccines, you know, not just for our patients, but for the many people that uh, work here at the university and, of course, uh, for our students. I'm still very hopeful that the state's going to start switching, uh, I'm predicting, in the coming weeks to working with major employers. And we are one of the major employers around the state. Uh, and as Dana said, we've got a capacity to deliver over 20,000 injections per week, and we could even scale up from there. So we could take care of the entire population of people that work here in a matter of a couple of weeks, uh, given adequate supply. 
Uh, the other thing I'm working hard to do, uh, and I hope we're successful, but uh, it's very uncertain still, is to be able to give vaccines to students before they head home. So we've got a few tens of thousands of students that'll be leaving here at the end of the semester, and they'll be traveling back home to their families around the state, but also around the country. Uh, think of how great it would be to be able to vaccinate all of our students before they depart Ann Arbor. Uh, so I remain hopeful, but I also, in saying that, encourage all of our students and our faculty and staff uh, to uh, look widely for the availability of vaccine. The easiest seems to be pharmacies or the health department. Get yourself on a whole bunch of lists and uh, make an appointment and go ahead and get the vaccine. The easiest thing you can do. And uh, you know, Preeti's uh, comment about being afraid of needles, this particular vaccine is given with amongst the skinniest needles that ever get used. And before you know it, it's done. Some people look over at the person doing the vaccination and say, okay, I'm ready now. And they say, okay, you're finished. Uh, so please you know, get yourself in the queue for vaccination. It's the best thing you can do for yourselves and for all the folks you care about. Uh, I wanna thank Dana and the entire team leading our vaccination effort. Uh, it's very uh, challenging. I know they're both frustrated, but they also feel a sense of accomplishment in the tens of thousands of people we've already been able to vaccinate. So thanks very much, uh, Dana, and to your team. Uh, I'll now turn things back over to Dr. Milani to handle some uh, questions from the audience. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we we uh, we have a number of questions, and I know there's some that are coming in too. Um, when will uh, class statuses as either in person or remote be solidified? And you know, I'd like to make my class decisions for the fall based on whether classes are in person or remote. So if uh, Provost Collins wants to weigh in on that. Sure, sure, I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, and, and we do understand how important it is for students to have this information as they're making their decisions about classes. The schools and colleges are working as quickly as they possibly can to update the class modalities in the registration system so that uh, our students can make informed decisions about the fall. And a number of units have already posted that information and the others are, are finalizing them, uh, the class modalities and we'll post them very soon. So I, I can't give a, a set date, but those are moving forward. And again, many of them have already been posted and the others will be posted very soon. Um, again, we understand how that it's a bit frustrating that they're not all already there. Uh, so just be a, be a bit patient and they will be updated soon. Yeah, um, I'll ask you to weigh in on the next question too, is when will students and families interested in Michigan be able to visit campus? So there again, I don't have a firm date for when we'll be able to resume in campus, uh, I'm sorry, in-person campus tours, but individuals do have the option of a self-directed walking or car tour. We've actually developed a, a special digital mapping to enhance those tours and, and that uh, information is available. We're happy to provide those um, those self-guided and virtual tours to, to all who are interested. And you can go to the Office of Undergraduate Admissions website, which is www.admissions.umich.edu. Or if you call 734-764-7433, you can also get information about those self-guided digital and virtual tours as well. We do hope that we'll be able to resume in-person tours and campus visits at some point during the summer, even though those are likely to be offered at reduced capacity. So uh, we'll, we'll announce that as soon as we are uh, able to and have more concrete information. Yeah, I'll just add the the website is actually they've done a really good job of trying to bring some of some of this to people. And I think a lot of universities have had to pivot, you know, since those visits are no um, no longer possible, at least for now. Um, I think the next couple of questions are probably in my uh, wheelhouse. Uh, when can we stop wearing masks outside on campus? And I, I think this is another unknown. Um, I anticipate that at some point uh, the recommendation for outdoor masking may get lifted. I mean, it obviously eventually will be lifted. Um, I think it'll depend on when when rates come down in the community. Right now, they're going up, uh, and I think this is really going to be a function of uh, vaccination. You you saw those great graphs that President Schlissel showed. the uh, The graphs for vaccination look the same for COVID in the studies, and so I I do think we're going to get there, uh, but it's going to be a little bit bumpy between now and then. And you know, my hope is is that perhaps in the summer and fall outdoor uh, masking will become less uh, uh, 
essential, but more to come on that. Uh, related question is, can a limited number of vaccinated staff work together without masks? And you know, this is a good question. And you know, the, the recommendations from the CDC around what you can do when you're vaccinated, uh, these came forth this month. If, if you are um, fully vaccinated, you can gather with other people who are fully vaccinated. Those really are uh, applicable to what you're doing in your, your personal social space, you know, in your home, indoors. But at work, uh, the recommendation, and this is from the CDC, and this applies to the healthcare setting as well as other settings. And you know, frankly, most of most people outside the healthcare setting aren't working in person. In uh, but you still need to stay masked for now. Um, and you know, this is this is uh, this will also evolve over time. So even if you're vaccinated at work, it, it uh, doesn't change the the recommendation. Um, and so first live question, and I I, I think Dana maybe uh, can help me with this one. When vaccination appointments become available for students, will it be considered a medical priority to be excused absence from a class? Actually, this might be for the provost, sorry. Um, <laughs> I heard vaccination, I thought it was Dana, uh, but I didn't read ahead. Will it be considered a medical priority to be excused absent from class without academic penalty uh, in the event that is unavoidable to schedule around current class times? Yeah, so, so let me start by just stating again, because I don't think we can say it uh, too, too frequently, um, that we really strongly encourage all of our students and all of our employees to be vaccinated when they're eligible to do so. Uh, and I know we've said that a number of times, but we, we all feel very strongly about that, that to really want to encourage you. So with, as with any medical appointment, if it is possible to schedule at a time that doesn't conflict with, with classes, of course, that's the, the best option. But sometimes this won't be possible. And in those cases, please promptly notify your instructor and discuss what arrangements would be reasonable so to make up for that, abs um, for that absence. And I am asking instructors to be very flexible in this regard because it is very important uh, for, for people to get vaccinated. Um, and, and so I, again, appreciate the question. Great, a couple of questions for Dana. I know she's a little bit off camera right now. So Dana, um, questions coming in live here. Many people are having luck getting vaccines in smaller rural towns. Do you have suggestions on how to find where vaccines are available? And you did mention the the HR website has uh, some some guidance. Yeah, yes, it's a there's a tool. So if you just go to your campus HR website under the benefits and wellness tab, there's some really fantastic information there. The other source uh, we've talked a lot about even before that was stood up is called Vaccine MI, um, Vaccine Michigan, and that site tends to have where first doses are available. So more so than just Kroger is eventually vaccinating or Rite Aid or CVS. It's also a real time feed. I think uh, typically week weekly updates when we find out on Fridays that say, yep, this week, Michigan Medicine has first dose appointments available. Um, I, I, I think the distribution between high density populated areas and rural towns, the state's working really hard to try to make sure that new shipments that come in go to those areas that are less saturated. So they're keeping a really close eye on the statistics about how, what percentage of the population in a region is vaccinated. So they're leveling that, but it's of course imperfect. And there's also the reality that people are moving and going where the vaccines are, you know, we're seeing that frequently as well. Yeah. And, and uh, talking with um, Dr. Uh, Khaldun uh, a few days ago, the, the social vulnerability index is some of the considerations too, particularly around Ford Field. Although I saw yesterday they had some walk-in appointments, which is really unusual for this. So they're doing, they're, I think they're, they're really trying to move vaccine. Uh, Dana, another question for you. If you're not over 50 and do not have underlying health conditions, is there any way to get a vaccine appointment before April 5th or should we just wait to sign up? Definitely don't wait to sign up because whether you're eligible or not, you can still get in queues for many of the uh, avenues I've described so far. So I would not wait. Some organizations I think are, are not letting you even sign up until you're eligible. So you might have a little work to do on the fifth as well, but definitely don't wait to sign up. And then uh, whether or not, I think you, you said if you're over 50, but do not have, or not over 50, but do, and do not have underlying health conditions, 
Um, there are occupational based eligibility criteria. So as you know, you know, phase 1A included a lot of the frontline healthcare workers, or there's been um, categories of others based on occupational exposure, our bus drivers, our police, firefighters, and others. So I think that answer is a little difficult to give generally, but if you look at the MDHHS website, there are examples of occupational based uh, criteria that would potentially make you eligible before the fifth. You know, Dana, just a question, and this is, uh, I actually have a personal interest in this, in, uh, in uh, children who are 16 or 17, so they're not 18, they're not adults yet, they are eligible for the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, is Pfizer available at most of these other sites, or is it something that only you have to go to MishMed? It's not exclusively MishMed by any means. I think many of the counties were actually built structure with the proper freezers and the, the same sort of logistical infrastructure that we had to build to deliver Pfizer that exists across the state. So we're not the only option for that by any means. And it's available uh, pretty widely now at this point. And I'll just take an opportunity to, to, to say, um, don't try to compare the vaccines, get what you can when you can get it. Vaccines in arms, they all prevent severe disease, hospitalizations, death. And they were tested in different scenarios. So it's a little bit like comparing apples to oranges. I worry when people start telling me like, well, vaccine efficacy was different. It, that isn't really what you should focus on right now. And I know the president said that as well. And um, his email later today, will will have some links on this. Uh, the next question, uh, this is uh, for the president. Vaccine rates are rapidly ramping up among researchers. When can research lab restrictions be lifted for these workers? Yeah, good question, Preeti. You know, so we're continuously tracking uh, the emerging data on the vaccine. And I would imagine in the weeks or months ahead, we'll have enough data to say that if everybody's uh, vaccinated, uh, you don't need masks. Uh, we're not at that stage yet. We're also trying to be air on the conservative side because we know that masks and distancing work. And it would be a shame to promote illness and the occasional hospitalization and the more occasional death uh, when we're on the precipice of being done with this disease. The other problem, to be honest, is you don't have a way to know for sure who you're in a room with that says they're vaccinated was really vaccinated. And uh, that's a tough thing to say, but we don't have 100% vaccination and we don't put a, a stamp on people's wrists like they do when you go to a club that you've had your ID checked. And so currently the rates of vaccination you know, are just not high enough yet to start unmasking. Uh, but we recognize that it's you know a pain, it slows you down, it's distracting, it's annoying, and we're anxious to you know get past this stage in the pandemic as quickly as we can, uh, and just ask you to hang in there a bit longer. We track the data, and we'll try to make our best informed decisions, balancing you know not wanting to be too conservative and not wanting to um, uh, cause spread of disease inadvertently as the pandemic is waning. Uh, you know, the other thing I wanted to go back and mention to the teacher and me. Uh, someone asked uh, my uh, examples of these two vaccines. Um, uh, actually, uh, polio is a viral disease and diphtheria is a bacterial disease. Uh, and of course, COVID is a viral disease. Uh, there are good vaccines that work against both categories of diseases. It's uh, extremely rare for a vaccine to eradicate a disease so that it's gone forever. Uh, the only disease that's known to have been eradicated on earth through vaccination is smallpox. Uh, polio, we're getting closer and closer. Uh, so the vaccine won't get rid of COVID. It'll, it'll drop its level down to being so low uh, that it's more like influenza, like we had hoped it was in the very beginning of the pandemic. And we're, we're starting to see what that looks like in Israel, where they've, they have vaccinated a lot of their population. So it gives you a little peek in terms of what things might and look like as we get It's probable that eventually people will have to get vaccinated from time to time. Uh, I, not, I don't think it's going to turn out to be every year, but you know we're not sure. And if more variants pop up, the RNA vaccines can be very quickly modified to cover these variants. So you might need boosters from time to time. That data is not available yet. I don't think it'll be like flu where you need a new shot every year or you're out of luck. The, the genetics of the virus is different than the flu virus, uh, but all this is heading in the right direction and we're learning more every day. Yeah, it's all good news. Uh, so another question, is it possible for students to use a local testing site other than a U of M campus testing site to complete their weekly testing requirement? And the short answer on this is no, they do need to use our uh, the CSTP sites. And again, those sites are all over 
uh, very convenient hours. They've done their very best to try to make this 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 uh, as convenient as possible. So you do need to get tested. And this is going to come up for commencement. Uh, so we hang tight. More details to come. I think people are really thinking about what that's going to be like to to do that quick turnaround uh, for a vaccination. Um, Another question for President Schlissel, with Rutgers saying students must be vaccinated to return to campus in the fall, has there been any, any talk about this here? Yeah, so far of the major universities, Rutgers is the first one that I've seen make a statement like that about a required vaccination to come back to school. Uh, we haven't had those discussions yet. Uh, I think it's premature. The vaccines are still under um, emergency use authorization. Eventually, they'll be completely licensed by the Food and Drug Administration. I think that'll make the conversation you know, more ripe to have. Uh, right now, since there's less vaccine than there are people who wanna be vaccinated, uh, we'd like to keep this voluntary. Uh, I do think though, there'll be incentives to be vaccinated. You know, For example, uh, just like you need your response of blue filled out to go into a facility or to go into an event, I can imagine a circumstance where you'll need your response of blue to indicate you've been vaccinated in order to go into an event that has lots of people or in order to go into a, you know, a building under certain circumstances that is now unmasked, for example. Uh, uh, to go into graduate commencement in the big house, if you wanna watch commencement in the big house, you'll have had to have been tested. Um, uh, we'll be in a circumstance come the summer when if you've been vaccinated, you don't have to be tested every week anymore. So I think there'll be lots of good incentives to be vaccinated as well. So we're not ready to have the conversation yet about mandatory, it might end up there. Yeah, no, this is more to come. And uh, Martino, I think uh, you wanted to make a point, a brief point. Yes, I'm certainly not the vaccine ex expert, but I wanted to put in a plug for students who will be new to the University of Michigan this fall to also get vaccinated over the summer. If, it, if, it's, a, if it's possible, if it's available, don't wait until fall. Um, that's information that will help us with residence hall planning and to promote safety in the residence hall. So I wanted to put in a plug for that. And I also want to make a course correction. I misstated a date on the union's extended hours. It's Monday, April 5th. That starts with the union and the canopies are April 1st. So that's uh, my fault on that. I just wanted to correct that. Thank you. Yeah, April feels like a like a long time from now, but it's it's around the corner. And I, I just want to reiterate the, the vaccination plan too. Uh, I think just like you plan on a lot of things, have a plan to get vaccinated and you know, understanding that different states are at different points and it's going to be a while before it's open season in some states. Um, we also recognize that we have a large number of international students that come here and they may not have access at all. Um, so just please know that the team at UHS is thinking about this. And I think the summer is gonna look very different. I expect that they will have a supply of vaccine. They don't right now, but you know, things change day to day, week to week. So more to come on that, but, but when it's your turn, when you're eligible, get vaccinated. And I'm gonna turn it back to the president to wrap us up. Great, thanks, uh, Preeti. I just want to clean up one loose end from a, a questioner and the question about research labs and density. Uh, uh, I spoke about masks in research labs for now. The question was whether we can go down to three feet of distancing based on new CDC guidance. Uh, I will check into this for you. I don't know whether we've moved uh, down to three feet. I'm sure it's coming if it isn't there now. So we'll get the answer and we'll make sure uh, that it's out there. Um, so, you know, Despite the optimism, I want to impress upon everybody that it's still important to be vigilant um, until uh, you're vaccinated and even after you're vaccinated until we understand whether vaccinated people can transmit the illness to unvaccinated people. Um, I have to tell you a story. It's in the media now, but uh, our sports teams are doing incredibly well. But my heart goes out to our men's hockey team. Uh, so um, they were headed to the Sweet 16 of hockey, and we just learned that Several of the student athletes have tested positive for COVID and the team has had to withdraw. Uh, so I, I wanted to congratulate them on a great season and tell them I feel you know, very badly that they can't continue on and compete. Uh, uh, it's not for lack of trying. All of our student athletes have really, in effect, put themselves into a bubble and been amongst the most disciplined in our community. So if it could happen to a number of students that are being exceptionally careful and being tested regularly, uh, we're still all subject to infection. So please continue to be careful uh, during the coming weeks as we develop higher and higher protection as a community uh, from COVID. 
So thanks very much for uh, joining us today. And thanks to my colleagues uh, uh, who uh, joined the briefing. Uh, we'll continue to look through the questions from the Q&A and post answers or modify answers based on this new round of questions. Uh, have a, a great weekend, everybody. Good luck to our men's and women's basketball teams playing in the days ahead. Uh, and thank you all very, very much for continuing to be so committed uh, to the research and teaching and education and clinical care uh, by the University of Michigan. So thanks very much and go blue.